Good evening, this is Dolores Cannon again with the Metaphysical Hour. And we are late tonight. The little gremlins got into the computers again down at the BBS uh, radio. And every once in a while that happens. And when they really like to play and get mischievous, you know, they can really mess everything up. So they said some of the stations went down and they're just now getting everything going again, but it makes everything delayed. So um, I hope you're still out there anyway. But um, anyway, tonight, let me go ahead and give out the toll-free number first in case anybody wants to call in. The toll-free number is 877-876-5227. 877-876-5227 if you want to call in. And, you know, I was out of town this last week. I had to give my class, my hypnosis class, in Daytona Beach, Florida. So we're back on tonight, and I have a special guest tonight. It's Dale Kazmarek, and this is a real ghost hunter. So we're going to uh, see what he has to say. But Dale is the head of the Ghost Research Society. And he has a website, and he's been active hunting for uh, ghosts, hauntings, poltergeist uh, phenomena since 1975. So that means he's been doing this for over 30 years, had a lot of experience at all of this. He's also involved in the vo electronic voice phenomena, if any of you know about that. So we're going to have him telling about some of his cases and things, too. And he's been on a number of very uh, well-known TV shows, and he's done a lot of lectures. So Dale Kaczmarek, he's on the line with us now. You there, Dale? Yes, I am. Hi. So we don't have the little gremlins messing with us tonight, we hope. No, they were messing with us at your conference, though, I remember, down in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, a bit. Yeah. But yes, uh, Dale was at my conference that I put on in uh, June here in uh, Fayetteville, so that way I got to meet him. But he's as busy as I am, so this is the first time I've been able to have him on the show. Okay, Dale, let's uh, go ahead and, and tell them about yourself, because I want to know how in the world you got into this. How did you become a ghost hunter? Well, I've been doing it for quite a number of years, I guess. I can kind of blame uh, my interest in this uh, to my parents, uh, basically telling me ghost stories when I was a youngster. Uh, yeah. My uh, parents basically uh, were very into uh, ghost stories. My grandparents uh, uh, came from Poland, and I often heard from my grandmother uh, ghost stories from Poland, uh -huh. uh, including one of a, uh, a Polish or at least a, a female ghost that was often seen standing by a bridge. And she would tell me the story about this, this ghost that uh, would approach people coming to this bridge, crossing some water, and they would say, he would say something to, to the person like, could you cross the water with me? Could you carry me across the water? And uh, they would carry this ghost across the bridge. It would get on the other side, put it down, thank him, and it would disappear. Uh, uh -huh. So these are kind of stories that I grew up with and, of course, a lot of stories here in the Chicagoland area uh, that I'd heard as a youngster. In fact, uh, my mom and dad, when they were dating back in the 1930s and 40s, uh, late, uh, late 30s, early 40s, uh, my dad's favorite thing to do on a date after uh, taking my mom out was to drive around a very uh, haunted cemetery uh, here in the south side of Chicago called Resurrection Cemetery, often known for the ghost sighting of a hitchhiking ghost story named Resurrection Mary. That'd be an and, interesting uh, date to go to a cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My mom often told me how she uh, was absolutely terrified by this and if my dad, I guess I take it after that side of the family because he always wanted uh -huh. to see if there was something there, if there was something to the story, if it was simply more than just a folk tale or a legend. They never saw anything, but these were the kind of things that I was brought up with, these kinds of stories and hearing about so many places in Chicago. So as I grew older, I just decided to uh, uh, check out some of these locations to see if, in fact, they were, uh, there was something more to the story than simply uh, folk tales, legends, or just... Uh, um, you know, hand-me-down stories from generation to generation. You know, and, in fact, uh, they're hand-me-down for so long. Sometimes they can be changed, too. Exactly. Uh, they can be embellished and sensationalized so much so they don't even uh, resemble the original story at all because yeah. people continue to add on to the story over and over throughout the years. 
So that does happen. I know that. Yeah. So that Are was you one, there? Yeah, that was like that was one way basically how I got involved. Bring in, blank. I was thinking the Gremlins were. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I hope not. But go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say that's one way that how I got involved in as I began uh, starting my research group. Uh, I've been doing it um, this since 1975, but I actually began the group about two years later in 1977. Uh, so the Ghost Research Society has uh, already gone beyond 30 years itself um, here in the Chicagoland area. And uh, what we try to do is uh, research, investigate, and check out locations uh, throughout the city, throughout the suburbs. And uh, even northwest Indiana, southern Wisconsin, um, and parts of Missouri, as far as we can travel and so forth, because uh, I find it very fascinating that uh, people have these encounters with ghosts and poltergeists and, and uh, uh, apparitions and so forth. And uh, as I began to uh, get more and more uh, calls from people, began to uh, put together this website that I have, I... Uh, it's the quickest way now to get uh, information back across the internet, uh, uh, information superhighway, so to speak, they call it. Yeah. And, uh, you can I, find anything on the internet now. Exactly. So people uh, began to contact me through the website, and uh, now I, I don't do this full time, I, but I do a lot of my spare time. I try to go on vacation uh, and spend some time on vacation to interesting sites around the country. Uh, we just got back from a trip from uh, a couple of trips actually this year. We went down to Bargetown, Kentucky. Uh, lots of interesting sites in there that we had a chance to investigate and also in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, including the very famous Hannah House, which is haunted uh, in Indiana. We uh -huh. had a chance to uh, be out there and uh, see some interesting sites there as well. So we're planning a lot of, a lot of different things uh, for next year, including a trip out to Waverly Hill Sanitarium uh, out so there. So the in, people uh, Kentucky. call in and or on your website and tell you about these places? Uh, so, sometimes they do. Uh, a lot of times I do get reports from people that have had encounters, or sometimes they say, have you heard of this particular story? And uh, that's how it kind of gets the ball rolling, where I can uh, then go back and do a bit of research uh, on the site um, to uh, find out you know, what's been going on, what people have experienced, and the history, which I think is very, very important uh, in ghost reports, is not only the, the reports of what's been going on, but the past history of the site um, often is an indicator of um, what's going on now because something may have happened back in time. There may have been some sort of trauma, some tragedy, some untimely death uh, that for some reason is now causing the ghost to manifest in some form, uh, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. That's what I found. Usually it has to do with something uh, traumatic or, or dramatic and something violent because... Uh, you hardly ever have a peaceful ghost, but I don't know. But you, may, you may have found some. But well, I find, we go find back a lot of mischievous oh. ghosts, a lot of ones that are that, that they are very prankish and, and play tricks on people. But, I mean, uh, if you look at what Hollywood has done with, with ghost stories here in movies in recent years, like uh, Ghost with Patrick Swayze, uh, the other with, with the Cole yeah. Kidman, uh, Bruce Willis in Sixth Sense, White Noise, you know, all those people that portrayed ghosts in all those motion pictures, did not realize that they had, in fact, died because of the, because of the way they died, suddenly, traumatically, or violently, unexpectedly. And they just kind of hung around for a time, pretty much, uh, uh, until they kind of found out that they could not communicate, you know, like we do to the living people, and mm -hmm. uh, were just kind of earthbound, I guess, for a bit. Yeah, I found uh, that, that in my own work, too, that sometimes, especially if they die suddenly, there's confusion, and they're not sure if they're dead or not. Exactly. And like I, you said, the only ones they can't communicate would be those people who were receptive enough, like certain psychics, who could hear them. Yes, indeed. I mean, uh, we, we do work with uh, some professional psychics, and we have a few people in our group which are, I won't say they're psychic, but they're kind of intuitive yeah. and can kind of pick up bits of feelings and so forth. And uh, those people that are very, very open-minded to the subject, I think, are those are the ones that seem to have a lot of experiences. Because uh, I've had some on off, my show, some of them are very good friends of mine, mm -hmm. who are constantly communicating, you know, with those who have crossed over. So I know it's very possible. And the one friend of mine up in New York said it would get a little aggravating. She'd try to sleep, and there'd be a, 
a spirit or a ghost next to the bed trying to get her to go and tell their relatives a message or something. And she said, well, I don't know these people. How can I do this? But they wouldn't leave her alone until she would convey the message. And so, you know, these kind of strange things happen, and I believe the people who have told me those stories. Yeah, I, 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 you know, that's one thing I, I find you know very convincing is is the uh, how strongly people feel about their encounter when they call me or write to me or email me uh, yeah. that they have in fact ruled out a lot of you know natural explanations. It's not the you know uh, birds in the, um, in the in the attic or squirrels running around the attic. It's not you know noisy pipes. It's not the wind whistling through the uh, a, you know, a broken window or something, but they yeah. actually explored other ways and other areas to kind of rule out natural explanations. And they, what they're left with is is something they can't explain many times. Mhm. And I know there's lots of photographs that have been taken too. You you probably dealt with those. Yes, uh, I've been um, uh, for the last uh, 25 years or so. I've really been fascinated with the aspect of spirit photography uh, because uh, I. Uh, not only because of pictures that I saw in books as a youngster and uh, television shows, newspaper articles, and so forth, but uh, actually being, being able to capture some images ourselves uh, during, during our research and investigation. Um, I did write a book called The Field Guide to Spirit Photography, which kind of takes the, the layman or the novice directly through all the aspects of the camera, uh, tells ways to better your chances to get things on uh, videotape or, or 35 millimeter cameras or different types of uh, Polaroid film. And oh. uh, throughout the years, it's been, um, I've, I've gotten literally just thousands of photographs that people have sent me through the Internet, which I, I, I've kind of brought that on by myself, I guess, by telling people I would do a, a, a look at photographs and give kind of a free analysis or my opinion on them. Yeah. So I get a, 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 major, a, a lot of these coming in uh, on a daily or weekly basis. And a lot of them, unfortunately, you know, aren't you know, true spirit photographs, but uh, many people that are not really uh, kind of in the know of spirit photography or what to expect uh, of just natural things that can show up on the film that have a real natural explanation, like uh, double exposure or flash glare yeah. Or, uh, just a camera strap or something getting in the way of the lens or uh, just an ordinary yeah. explanation. And so it's nowadays, so much can be faked with the computers. Yes. Uh, with There's people like that that are just trying to fool you? Well, I've never I actually had uh, too many. I, I think I, there have been several, um, uh, perhaps a, a, uh, maybe even as much as 100 that I think may have possible, possibly been uh, photoshopped in or somehow no. manipulated by the uh, um, by the uh, computer software because it, there's very very telltale signs uh, when when an image has been tampered with and sometimes the image is what I like to call it just simply too good to be true uh-huh. <laughs> it just looks too realistic just too um, uh, sensational to really be a spirit photograph and uh, sometimes people do try to uh, you know. You know, send these in, and there are a lot of internet frauds going on in the internet. Uh, oh yeah, where, I know that. Whether you're able are to tell, frauds. you're able to tell by looking at the photograph. It's a, if it is has been tampered with, it it is a fake or not. I yeah, I've seen so many of the these images. I mean, I can usually within the first ten or fifteen minutes of looking at a photograph uh, come up with an explanation for it. Now some are a little bit harder to. Um, uh, ascertain actually what is the cause because uh, they, they sometimes do take a bit of analysis. Uh, I do have other software that I can scan the image into and kind of brighten up and play with the contrast and yeah. uh, sharpen it up and enhance it a bit. Uh, so some of these photographs end up in what I call simply kind of a paranormal bin, and uh, it's just a, a photograph I don't have an explanation for. It may be a spirit photograph, but it's, it's not something that's at least what's caused naturally. And so that's kind of the in-between between the, the fakes and the natural explanations and what may be a real ghost photograph, uh, yeah. which could be uh, something that I believe probably was caused by a spirit in some way. Well, I've seen some of these real old ones, you know, back in the old books, 
when they had the older equipment that were really hard to explain. So I was thinking they could be real because uh, they didn't know how to really fake it that much back then. Exactly. One good example of that is the very famous Brown Lady of Raynham Hall. Uh, that was taken in, in, in England in 1936, and this was taken by a professional photographer who was simply there to, to photograph the interior of the house. He wasn't doing ghost hunting or ghost busting or anything like that. He yeah. was just there to photograph the interior of the house, and he came to a staircase, and he saw what looked like a shadowy or glowy image of something descending down the staircase, and he snapped the photograph, and that was in 1936, and that is on my website. It's on numerous websites, and to this day, nobody's been able to uh, say it's been faked, that it was something else. Uh, it looks like a person actually descending down the stairs, and there was reports in this house called Raynham Hall of a of a brown lady. Uh, uh, England has a very colorful ghosts. I mean, they have pink ladies, green ladies, white ladies. <laughs> yeah, I know. Ladies. I go to England a lot, and the place is so old, and the buildings are so old. They've been there forever. You know, over here we tear something down if it's a hundred years old. So there is a lot of energy, maybe even trapped energy and things, because uh, they do. Like you said, they do have a lot of colorful things going on there. They sure do. I, I've been to England myself on, on several occasions uh, in 85 and 87, uh, and I, I was able to tour a lot of very famous haunted sites like the, uh, the infamous Tower of London, uh, right in London, uh, England. Uh, probably I was one just of in the Tower of London a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, it is, a, it is an amazing place. It truly is. There is so much history there. Uh, dating all the way back to uh, uh, 1066, uh, uh -huh. and just this layer upon layer of tragedy, trauma, violence that has happened uh, in that um, uh, uh, that tower, and basically was used as a political prison for one time. And lots yeah, of people and they've were had beheaded. so many beheadings and things like that there too, you know. Yes, but you know, it could be also when a place like that has so much violence attached to it, it could be the accumulation of the energy of all those events, too, could remain. Oh, by all means, definitely. And that's the kind of energy that psychics often do pick up on, uh, people that are very sensitive, and even some of the equipment that we do use in, in our work can actually pick up on some of this energy that's kind of a residual energy left behind. Uh, well, that's by... what I tell people. You can feel it yourself, the opposite between going into a beautiful cathedral, opposite going into a jail. You can see the difference in the energy you pick up, you feel. Most people, I don't know if they would or not, but I can tell the difference when you walk into a jail. It's a very heavy, dense energy, and you go into a, a cathedral, it's a different kind of a feeling. So I believe places do have their own kind of accumulated energy. Oh, by all means. Uh, I, I, we have been into uh, places uh, throughout Chicago, uh, like in, in, in and around Chicago, which were uh, um, either insane asylums uh, or, or jails or churches or restaurants, bowling alleys, uh, places yeah. like that. And the energy is different in, in, in these locations because of the people that, that walk through the door at these yeah, establishments. Yeah, because of the things that happen there. Yes, exactly. I remember a few years ago, I was giving lectures in Scotland, and I did one this night, and it was in a real old, old ancient courthouse. I don't know why they picked this place, but the lecture was done in a courtroom. You know, the people, the audience was sitting in the, uh, the seats, and I was up at the front. And it was very dim light in there for some reason, and I really felt so funny, like you could feel stuff coming out of the walls. And I remember the caretaker was a woman, and she said, I'll let you in, but she said, promise me you won't leave before I do. <laughs> she didn't want to be alone in that place. <laughs> but look at what could have happened over hundreds of years in a courtroom. That's what I kept thinking. It's the accumulated energy of all the things, the emotions that would have taken place there. Right, the sentencing of people to, you know, death or life imprisonment and... Yeah, and just just you know a very heavy feeling. Uh, we've experienced that in, in pl places like that here in Chicago. One one example just outside of Chicago was the very famous Crown Point, Indiana jail, where John Dillinger, oh, uh, 
the uh, very, very famous that where he was robber. killed, or he was killed in the city, though, wasn't he? He was killed in in, uh, in at the Biograph Theater, but he escaped the lady in from red. that jail. The lady in red that betrayed him. Exactly. Uh, that was the last jail that he was actually in prison, and he was supposed to be an escape-proof jail, but he, uh, as the story goes, he whittled a, a gun out of a bar of soap, painted it with black shoe polish, and stuck it into a rib of a guard and make it, made his escape to Chicago. <laughs> and uh, people that was in the that one jail outside have, of uh, Chicago? Pardon me? Is that where you, uh, you were investigated, the one outside, or what? Uh, we've we've been to the Biograph Theater. Uh, we have we yeah. hope to uh, go to the Crown Point Jail uh, sometime next year. Okay, uh, because I know he was to... shot outside of the theater. Exactly, he uh, was shot. What, as what he happened came out. at the uh, at the other place, the Crown Point? Uh, the Crown Point is just a jail that he escaped from. We have not had a chance to to actually go to that location yet, but I've been doing some research on it. Uh, to find out the the actual jail cell and to find out more about that and get permission to go in there to maybe do an overnight uh-huh. investigation. <laughs> well, I do want to tell the audience, too, that you do uh, ghost tours of Chicago, don't you? I sure do. Uh, they're basically year-round, but uh, obviously, as you get closer to Halloween, they're, they're very popular. Oh, I, I bet you're really getting a lot of people calling up now, aren't you? <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, between that and doing... Uh, uh, park district tours and library lectures and book signings and so forth. I'm, uh, my whole month is pretty booked up for October, but the uh, the tours that we run in Chicago are called Excursions into the Unknown. Yeah. And I began them in 1982, so it's been going on for uh, about uh, starting our 26th year in doing ghost yeah. tours in Chicago. And uh, it was just an idea I had put together a number of years ago with uh, a, a, a fellow psychic I worked with at that time, who was Pat Shenberg. She was the a past president of the Illinois Society for Psychic Research. And uh, we came up with this idea to uh, kind of do a bus trip to show people what a haunted location would look like and to experience the aura of the place. Yeah. And uh, be, I, I never imagined it would become as popular as it did uh, and go on for so many years. And now uh, we have so many different lo- locations uh, throughout the city and suburbs, about 175 places that it can actually take people to on these oh. tours, so we've uh, put together so many different routes of a north side, a south side, a, a city tour, uh, and even special tours uh, um, that we do uh, in spring and summer uh, that are like theme, to- uh, theme uh, tours of different sites around the city, including a haunted Archer Avenue tour. And uh, Do you take a bus and take people, or what? We have all different sized vehicles. I actually have a 15-passenger van that I have for even smaller groups that, that can go on it. And we uh, go from uh, minibuses that hold about 25, 26 people up to a full-size 57-passenger motor coach, which I use around Halloween. Mm. So I was thinking around Halloween, you get a lot of them wanting to do that. <laughs> yeah, and especially since Halloween, uh, this year is on a Friday and on a Saturday. Uh, basically, uh, uh, these are going to be two real busy times for me. And uh, we always do something a little special for Halloween. Uh-huh. Uh, for the Halloween tour, we always kind of give uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of like raffles and door prizes and trick-or-treat candy for those adults that obviously were not trick-or-treating on Halloween, so they get their trick-or-treat candy uh, on the bus. We do have uh, snacks and refreshments as well. And uh, this seems to be very popular. Uh, this year we're actually going to be going into a section of a city called Chinatown, uh, which is a uh, very, yeah. very haunted. In fact, one so if anybody is in the Chicago area and is interested in these tours, they can get a hold of you, can't they? They sure can. They can, they can go directly to my website, ghostresearch.org, and there's a big banner in the center of the uh, page that says Excursions into the Unknown. You can click on that. It'll take you directly to the site. It has the, the dates listed, the times, and the price, and uh, you can sign up directly online using a credit card, you know, MasterCard, Visa, Discover. So that's ghostresearch.org. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they want to find out more about all of this, and if they're interested in your research, or if they want to send you anything, any pictures or any stories, can they contact you on your website? Definitely. We do have a a, a direct email link to me. On the bottom of the page is a little ghost mailbox. They can just click on that. That's my direct email. They can send me uh, photographs or uh, correspond with me or just 
tell me a story if they have something interesting that's happened to them in their lifetime. Yeah, because you're probably accumulating a lot of stories. Oh, yeah. My files here in this room have literally over uh, overextended my this, the, the little office I have down here in the basement uh, between the, the, the bookshelves for all my books that I've accumulated over the years, but the files and research materials actually started to uh, encroach upon the next room. <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> okay. But I want to back up a bit. You were talking about taking the photographs. I know at our conference you were speaking of that, too. Uh, Tell them, do you have to have a special kind of camera or equipment? What do you recommend if somebody wants to try to get pictures of ghosts? Uh, I have seen examples on, of spirit images on literally every type of camera, uh, from, uh, from a 126 to a 110 brownie to a 35 millimeters, uh, to even the, the newer digital cameras. Um, so you really don't have to have a special camera or special film. You just uh-huh. have to be there at the right place at the right time, and that's really uh, what I've determined. Most often, when people take photographs, um, and the majority of the photographs that I get that people send me through my website are ordinary photographs under ordinary conditions. Somebody's taking a picture of a birthday party, a graduation, a picnic, a gathering of friends, and then something shows up in the foreground or the background that was not there. They didn't see it. And it later just showed up through the development process or, you know, uh, in the digital uh, image uh, just a few seconds later. Uh And uh, that's what I consider a true spirit photograph. In other words, there was nothing there to be seen. Um, The image was simply captured because you're using a very fast shutter speed, sometimes very sensitive film, and shutter speeds that are faster than the wink of our eye. So in that fraction of a second... Uh-huh. There was something there that the camera perceived, but it was so fast that it, it, it literally, our eyes did not have a chance to register it as a viable image, send the message to our brain to say, hey, there's something there. But the camera captures it because the camera yeah. was able to freeze that fraction of a second and you know, put it on you know, a digital image or you know, on a 35 millimeter piece of film. That's a theory I've come up with because people send me so many strange photographs, and they want to know what they are, and I've seen a lot of things at the different conferences, and I came up with the theory that our equipment now, the cameras and everything, are becoming so sophisticated that they're using more sensitive, uh, well, you can't say film, but the digital, but I mean, they're becoming so sensitive that I think they are picking up things that we couldn't do on the old cameras. Oh, most definitely. So uh, some of the original old, uh, the 110 and 126 Brownie cameras, they were simply fixed focused, fixed shutter at 125th of a second. You couldn't change that. You couldn't increase it. You didn't have sensitive film. You only had one yeah. kind of film to put in there. So now you got these cameras that go to 1,000 and 2,000 speed films. you got 5,000th of a second of, of a shutter speed. Uh, you got these digital images that show up, and the digital cameras are great uh, for ghost hunting because you get that instant picture. You instantly see, without having to take it to the, you know, to the photo lab and develop it like film, you instantly see that there's something there. And those uh-huh. are great. Yeah, because it's right there in the camera, and it can't be tampered with that way either. Exactly, exactly. You have it in your digital uh, image, and you can actually show people, hey, I just, this is what I just shot. There's something here. Uh, and they're great. We use them uh, extensively now in our work, but we do use 35 millimeters too because I always like to have a backup camera for a digital because the more cameras you have facing an area and snapping a picture, and if, if all the cameras get it, then you're really kind of uh, uh, scratching your head to, to figure out what's there. And we have a good example uh, actually here in Chicago. Uh, we had a, um, a site that was very well known to be haunted, and uh, a, me, a gentleman was out there uh, with his son one afternoon, and one of them had a 110 pocket instamatic, and another one had a Polaroid camera. Now, Polaroids were good at the time, too, because in 60 seconds, you got an image that was developed in your hand. Yeah, you and didn't have to go through the film process thing, around, you know. Uh, they, they, they knew right away they got something because they got the instant Polaroid. 
But yeah. then about a week later, when they got that film back from the photo lab, it was also something identical on the 110. So both cameras captured the very same image that was not there, not visible to the naked eye. Mm. Okay. So to me, that's, that's real good proof that there was something there that the camera saw that the, 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 the human eye was not able to pick up. So anyway, if somebody wants to, if they know the place they suspect is haunted, then uh, it would be fun for them to go out and you know, try to, to set up you know, cameras and see what they can come up with. Yeah, that's one way of doing it. I always like to uh, you know, say there's other uh, ways you can better your chances of finding the, the precise location in, in a site. If you're visiting a cemetery, a haunted house, a haunted battlefield, or something of that nature. Uh, if you have an animal, like a dog or a cat, they often react to strange things that they feel and pick up. Yeah, they so can pick it up. I, I believe so. I do, I, I've actually seen animals react very strangely uh, to places that we knew uh, there was. Well, I've, in my work, I found out they can see things we can't see. Mm -hmm. That, you know, of course, a lot of it has to do with smell, but I think that they actually are picking up with their eyes even something that we don't see is there. And even sound. I mean, dogs can hear a dog whistle. Oh, that, yeah, they hear we what can't we can't hear. hear. Yeah, it's, it's ultrasonic, and uh -huh. they can hear that. All we hear is just the, the air going through there, just making kind of a, a whistle sound, but that pitch they actually hear. And uh, uh, But I, I found that cats especially can see things we can't see. And if you ever watch a cat, you know that. They're sitting there watching something, and their tail is flicking back and forth. You know they're looking at something we can't see. So, you know, animals are more sensitive. We ought to pay more attention to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, in, in lieu, I always tell people, in lieu of a good psychic or a clairvoyant or a medium or something, bring along a pet. Um, uh, especially a younger pet, uh, an older dog or a cat. You know, they're they're older, grumpy. You know, they they might not even care if they saw something anyway. But <laughs> they're a younger just too pet used might to it. Good. They don't care. <laughs> a young, a curious uh, animal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Of course, another possible way of, of, of bettering your chances too, and, and if, if people want to go to my website, there's there's information about some of the equipment that we actually use in investigations. You know, some of that equipment can be purchased. Uh, you know, through various sites on the Internet for relatively inexpensive, depending on how sophisticated you really want to become. Uh, some of them goes for $20, $30, and some of them go for a couple of hundred. And by using some of this equipment out in the field or at a battlefield or a house or whatever, you begin getting a reading on that. That might be an area you might want to snap some photographs of. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, you know, up here where we live, it was north of where you were at Fayetteville. We have the city called Eureka Springs. And I think I was telling you about some of the... Uh, Eureka Springs is extremely haunted. There's well-documented uh, uh, ghosts all over it. And I didn't know if I told you about that when you were here or not. Yeah, I believe that hotel actually is. Yes, the Crescent Hotel is well-known. It has at least three ghosts that have been documented. But it went through such a colorful past that it had so many things there. It was a girls' school way, way back, and they was always the they could see a girl that was supposed to be walking down the halls. But then it was also a, a hospital, and there's supposed to be a nurse that they see in there. And then there's also a what's well known as the janitor. Everybody calls it Michael, and he has been seen a lot and. Uh, for a while, they had a little nightclub in the hotel, and they called it Michael's Place. But uh, And there's also one room in that hotel that is the haunted room with the haunted mirror. People have seen ghosts appear in the mirror in that room. And there's a long waiting list for people to, they want to stay the night in that room. The haunted room, yes. Yeah, especially around Halloween. Everybody always wants that room. But there's also some other places in Eureka Springs that are haunted. One is the Basin Park Hotel. Now there, they said it used to be a house at one time, and that there was uh, two girls lived there with their father. But they say you can still hear them playing the piano at night. 
So there's a lot of these things are that documented, and I believe it because uh, that's Eureka Springs is an old, strange town, and you know that's the kind of places these things happen in. I think. <laughs> yeah, a number of years ago, I did have a chance to uh, visit uh, Arkansas uh, places like Hot Springs and to investigate a, a ghost light out in Gurdon, Arkansas, uh, which I think I talked at, about at the conference. I uh, was uh, your conference. And, yeah. Uh, but I never had a chance to actually go to Eureka, Eureka Springs, uh, probably because I uh, had not heard about uh, some of the hauntings back then. But uh, a lot of these places now, like uh, hotels are, uh, that are haunted, uh, have made a, a real killing, especially around Halloween, if you will, <laughs> to get people to come in. Uh, there's a place down in, in Louisiana called the Myrtle Plantation. Uh, which is very well haunted, and they have a waiting list of about six months for the haunted room as uh-huh. well. So these uh-huh. places. Well, on the um, Sci-Fi Channel, they had the Ghost Hunters uh, TV show, and exactly. they came up and investigated the uh, the Crescent Hotel. But I was very disappointed because they didn't focus on some of the real phenomena. They focused on part, like what they had heard, but there was a lot more at that hotel that they could have covered, and they didn't do it. So that would be something for you to look into sometime. Oh, definitely. Uh, we, we're planning on making a, a, a number of trips uh, on upcoming years to some of the uh, deep, deeper south areas. Um, you know, we wanted to hit some haunted battlefields in Middle Tennessee, Chickamauga, Stones River, uh, uh-huh. Arkansas, of course, uh, you know, the Crescent Hotel, and even uh, at the Myrtles Plantation. I uh, want to get out to some of the haunted antebellum, antebellum homes out there in Savannah, Georgia. Oh, yeah, uh, those are the old Civil War places. Exactly. I've heard so many interesting ghost stories out there, including even the Civil War prison at Andersonville, uh, where so many uh, Union soldiers died during the Civil War. Yeah. Hmm. Well, one thing I do want to cover, you know, our time is ticking away at us here, and, but uh, I do want to cover the electronic voice phenomena also, because I've heard a lot about that. Now, have you observed that, or have you just investigated it? Well, we've actually we we actually do that ourselves. Um, my forte is really tell the spirit- people what that is. Sure, uh, electronic voice phenomena, or EVP, as it's sometimes called, is really the uh, is is people, researchers, attempting to make communication with the ghost and get responses on audio tape or yeah. digital, uh, digital of recorders. Um, it was long uh, ago researched by people like uh, Professor Hans Bender from Freeburg University, uh, Constantine Radebe, uh, even Sarah Estep for many, many years in the American Association for Electronic Voice Phenomena uh, researched and got many very clear voices on tape but the whole idea behind this is you take a tape recorder, uh, digital or cassette, you go into an, an area. It doesn't even really have to be known to be haunted. You simply ask a question. You leave about 20 seconds of blank space where there's no sound. Yeah. That, that's where the reply would go. Ask another question, leave 20 seconds, and so forth. And then play the tape back, and then very often many people will get a response, a voice, a sound, or something that they did not hear at the time it was being recorded, but only was imprinted, the theory being that ghosts have an energy, and this is magnetic recording tape, so it actually bypasses the physical microphone and directly imprints itself onto the magnetic tape. Therefore, you didn't hear it. And many people have gotten very clear voices, sometimes responding to questions asked, and even sometimes calling the researchers by name, which I found to be very fascinating. Uh, Well, I remember, it's been years ago, you probably heard about the research when I first heard about it, that it was possible, it's probably old-fashioned now, but I heard that they would put a tape recorder in a room that was soundproof, or sealed off some way, there was no people in the room, and they would just sit the tape recorder there, leave it there for hours at a time, and then whenever they would go in and get it, they would hear voices on it. Mm-hmm. You remember that research? Yes, I do. Uh, we we've, we've went a step further. We've actually done that ourselves in investigations where we've been to locations uh, 
one house was on the south side of the city of Chicago, and the attic was seemed to be the focus of this haunting. We put a tape recorder up there. Uh, we literally left the house uh, completely abandoned. We came back, you know, when the tape was uh, done recording, and we didn't get voices, but we got a lot of sounds. We got, like, uh, sounds of a rubber ball, ball bouncing on the floor, boom, 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 boom you know. And uh-huh. other sounds of footsteps and, and, and things moving around, and there was nothing, um, nobody up there. And yet we got uh-huh. what we call not electronic voice phenomena, but what I call electronic noise phenomena, sounds of things that we couldn't explain. Mm-hmm. I've been at conferences, too, where people will play tapes, and uh, you have to really listen close because sometimes the voice is so soft and they'll say it's saying certain things, but it's hard to really hear it to to see if that is if it's real or not. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's, it's difficult. It really, uh, it, I believe it actually takes a trained ear after a while to really decipher what's being said because very time, very often the the, the response is very um, mechanical or rhythmic sounding, like it's not talking like we do but might talk like this or something like that. And it's, you uh-huh. have to get the proper cadence and the, you know, the, the feel for what is actually being said. Now, Sarah Estep actually claimed that many times as she would use reel-to-reel tape recorders, as she would ask the question, sometimes the response would be recorded on the wrong side of the tape. So when she would play it back, she'd hear her voice speaking forward, but the spirit voice speaking backwards. Oh, okay. And she would have to flip the tape over to get the sound of the, the voice speaking forward. Now, that's very interesting because that, to me, shows some form of intelligence because it's not actually being recorded on the side that you're on. It's being recorded on the opposite side. It has to be able to do something like that. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you know, the ones I've the heard, key, they're very soft, too, and it's almost like a whisper. Yeah, many times they are. We uh, did an investigation in a, uh, 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 an old tavern, um, which at one time used to be a, a, a speakeasy uh, during the 1930s and uh, uh, 40s. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was a, a, a lot of activity going on in the basement. We, we heard about some of the reports of activity by the owners and some of the patrons. And we were asking, and we were doing an EDP session uh, down the bottom of the stairs where allegedly a man was killed there. And we, we asked yeah. the question, is there anybody here? And we didn't hear anything until we played the tape back later. The response was very clear. It says, I'm under the floor. Under the floor. So it makes me think that somebody killed that man and buried him in the basement. Mm-hmm. Of course, is there any way to prove that, any way to find no, out? No, without ripping up the floor, which I didn't think <laughs> the people that owned the bar would, would have appreciated us doing. <laughs> hmm. So these, uh, these are some of the uh, ways you can investigate this, besides taking the pictures and listening to the stories, is uh, with the electronic voice uh, equipment. And even videotape now uh, with 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 play uh, with the Sony night shot cameras that can literally record in total darkness. They send out an infrared beam of light. You can literally oh. go into a place without any light at all, and it's illuminated like it's broad daylight. And we use these very extensively in our work. And we've gotten some interesting images. You use of, those outside or in a house? Well, both actually, because they do run off of batteries. You can run them off the AC power, or you can run off batteries that can go up to 12 hours. Oh, and uh, we've actually gotten a lot of strange orbs. We've gotten some fogs and mist. We've actually gotten sounds on the audio portion of the videotape, uh, which we couldn't explain. That we okay. were all there. We all heard it. Couldn't figure out where it came from, though. I get hundreds of people, you know, sending me pictures of orbs, and then there's the other ones where there are these streaks of light. Mm-hmm. You see, you know what I mean. There's streaks yeah. of light in the picture. Uh-huh. And you know it's not uh, a double exposure, or it's not from light, other light sources. So those are the ones I've seen, I think, are, are those the most common ones? Yeah, I, I get a lot of people that, I, I've gotten so many orb p- pictures that I've actually had to tell people not to send me any more digital orbs, because... I told them the same thing. I've seen it. I yeah. know what, I, I, I believe it, but I've seen enough of them. Exactly. <laughs> They're not, it's, not, it's not too exciting anymore. <laughs> 
yeah, after a while it becomes, well, I've been there, done that, you know. Yeah, exactly. They even have a whole conferences devoted to orb pictures. And I keep thinking, why? Because now it's becoming very common. Yeah. I've seen entire websites that they're, all their pictures that are on their websites are of orbs. And I've actually had several books that I've picked up recently that just have dressed just orbs and nothing else. Yeah. Um, because that's kind of being overdone, I think. Yeah, I do believe so. And, uh, of course, I've had pictures, you know, pe- place, people have sent me of a haunted place, and they'll take a picture of a hallway, and there will be orbs appear and streaks of light and things like that. But uh, you see a lot of them with the streaks of light, too, don't you? Yeah. Um, what what I find fascinating, though, just to get back to the orb just for a second, though, is is uh, not so much the, the idea that people can capture orbs. I mean, you can shake a dusty rag in front of a camera and you'll have thousands of orbs. Yeah. Uh, or go outside at night and you might see insects and bugs flying around that look like orbs. But I've actually talked to people in, uh, recently here that have actually seen orbs with the naked eye. Things that are floating around, and then have no. snapped those pictures. Now, to me, that's that's fascinating because now you're actually seeing it as you're photographing it. So there's something actually physically there. Yeah, I have clients in my work. You know, a lot of them work in energy. They're either massage therapists or Reiki, or you know, they do energy healing. And they say while they're working on a client, sometimes they will see her orbs floating around the room. And maybe they're kind of in an altered state at that time. It makes it more easier for them to see it. Who's to say? Yeah, it's almost like being able to see auras around people in meditation yeah, states. Yeah, very so similar, forth. I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay, so there's a lot out there that's mysterious anyway. <laughs> there sure is. Well, we're I think coming we down to the time, but do you have any favorite story you want to tell before we go off the air? Well, uh, one of my favorite stories here uh, that you know, in Chicago that I've done a lot of work with is, of course, this, this uh, hitchhiking ghost story of Resurrection Mary that has literally been seen, this hitchhiking image of a girl in a long white dress and long blonde hair since the mid-1930s. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's much more than simply a folk tale and legend because there are many hitchhiking ghost stories, you know, Told in folklore, but so many people have actually experienced this that she's literally become Chicago's most famous ghost story. Yeah. They had a cab driver that picked her up. Uh, he was had just dropped off a fare in the south suburbs. He was totally lost. He was trying to find his way back towards uh, towards O'Hare Airport. He picked up this girl in the cab, uh, thought he'd get a free give her a free lift and get some directions back to the airport, but she was no help with with directions at all. On the way there, as they approached the gates of the cemetery, she suddenly said from the back seat, stop, this is the place. And when he turned around to see what she meant, there was no longer a girl in the back seat. Uh, the car, the cab had not stopped, the doors had not been opened, and the girl simply vanished from the back seat. And that's happened before to people. Uh, and this ghost looks like we do, a perfectly flesh and blood individual. I mean, yeah. uh, and she just got in the cab, apparently knew where she wanted to go, knew where she wanted to get off, and the cab didn't stop fast enough, apparently, and she just exited the vehicle without opening the doors, and this uh-huh. man was very But, you very know, we've heard up. many of these hitchhiking ghost stories that take place all over the United States. All over the world, actually, Oh, yes. yeah, that's a common one. So, you know. <laughs> okay, well, before we sign off, give them your information again so anybody who wants to can contact you. Sure, they can contact me directly through my website at www.ghostresearch.org. And ghost research is all one word. Uh, they can uh, click on the ghost mailbox at the bottom of the page if they want to talk to me and send me a direct email. And there's also information about the, uh, the tours for Halloween and the books that I sell. Uh, they're uh-huh. also listed on the website, the uh, uh, Windy City Ghost 1 and 2, the Spirit Photography book, and the one on Spook Lights are all listed on the website. Okay, so anybody's interested, these would make nice gifts, too, for Halloween. Oh, sure, definitely. Okay, so anybody wants to get a hold of Dale, they can contact him through his website. Okay, and I just want to give a little information on mine before we sign off. Um, I'm going to be having my next class is going to be in Kona on the Big Island in Hawaii. This is the middle of um, or the 1st of November. Uh, we had to cancel the China trip, 
but I'm going to Hawaii on the way to Australia and New Zealand, and I'll be doing several classes in Australia and New Zealand. Anybody who's interested in signing up for these, they can find out the information on my website. And it's ozarkmountain.com, O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. Or for those who are overseas, it's O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. And you can contact us about uh, the classes, about lectures, about sessions, everything you think you want. Okay, well, we're going to have to go off. They wanted us to stop one time so they can try to get this uh, computer mess back on, <laughs> on the track again because it, everything is really backed up. But, Dale, I want to thank you for coming on tonight. My pleasure. Okay, and you just keep ghost hunting. All right. Good night, Dale. And, good night. Thank you very much. And good night, everybody out there. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.